Once upon a time, when I joined the GeoServer project that was almost 20 years ago, uh, everything was so simple. You added your data to GeoServer, it was available to everyone, everyone was happy, and every everything was simple. Nowadays, they want to control who gets to see what, when, and, and uh, authenticate in the right way, and things got much more complicated. So this presentation is about figuring out what's going on. So shout out to my employer, Geo Solutions, offices in Italy uh, and the United States, soon to have uh, an office in Dubai as well. Um, we support a number of open source uh, projects and we are core developers in them. We provide support, core development, customized solutions, training, and what, whatever else you might think of around those projects. We strongly support uh, open and open source in various ways. And well, let's get to it. Security overview. Okay, so GeoServer internally is based on Spring security. Spring is a open source library that is underpinning many, many uh, Java programs and Spring Security is, well, what powers authentication and authorization. Mostly authentication, to be honest. The uh, security subsystem can be configured both through the web administration interface and through the REST API, and it allows us to secure the data, the services, and the administration of the server. Now, GeoServer Security offers both authentication and authorization, and they are both supported by vanilla GeoServer. So you download a GeoServer without any plugin, it already supports basic authentication and basic authorization abilities. If you need to have more, then you have to install plugins. In terms of terminology, it's the usual stuff, uh, role-based authentication, so we have users, groups, and roles, and then data is uh, controlled uh, Access to data is controlled by roles, and access to services is controlled by roles. In terms of authentication, uh, we support out of the box basic authentication, digest authentication, you know, the usual suspects, which are uh, form authentications, stuff like that. And, uh, and then there are extensions to offer other authentication mechanisms. I'll get to them later. And as I said, the authorization is role-based, so all security rules are defined against the, the roles. With some plugins, you can define uh, authentication, sorry, authorization rules against a particular user as well. User groups and roles, how do we relate to each other? Well, users can exist uh, on their own, they can belong to a group. Roles can exist on their own, they can be grouped uh, uh, in a hierarchy as well. They can be assigned to users, they can be assigned to groups. It depends on how you want to organize your uh, authorization mechanism. And by default, they are all stored inside the GeoServer Data Directory, but it's not the only way. Uh, you can also have all of this interact with a, an LDAP uh, server, uh, with a directory server of your choice, with um, uh, an external database, with auth, whatever. Um, the extension points allow us to integrate with other providers. These providers can provide a notion about what is a user, what is a role, verify that the user exists and it's valid, uh, and uh, yeah, attach roles to users. Um, and this is uh, a screenshot from the user interface where you define the, uh, the, the user groups and roles. So let's deal into, dive into authentication. So there are multiple authentication mechanisms and many can be active at the same time, maybe depending on, uh, the, um, on what you are trying to target. Like the user interface can have and normally has a different set of authentication mechanism compared to the services, compared to the REST API, and so on. So depending on the path you are hitting, we can have a different configuration of uh, uh, authentication mechanisms. That list of authentication mechanisms attached to a path we call an authentication chain, which is made of authentication filters, which can use authentication providers. And you are probably just losing me right now. Okay, so one by one. <laughs> when a request comes in, it goes through the authentication filters that can decide, okay, what is, how is this request trying to authenticate itself? Form, basic authentication, digest, uh, is there a JWT token in the request, and so on and you might have multiple, multiple ways. Is there a remember me cookie maybe to remember the authentication? Is there a, a session, server side, and so on. So these filters try to figure out how you're trying to authenticate. 
if they figure out that there are uh, authentication tokens that require the uh, attention, they leave, so they send the tokens to the authentication providers, which are the ones that uh, uh, can figure out, okay, this username and password are valid or not, for example, or this authentication token is valid or not. And uh, as I said before, you can have multiple chains attached to different um, endpoints. So to give an example, uh, let me see if I can find it. Yeah, okay, so this is the web authentication chain. The web, no, sorry, this is the OGC services authentication chain, where we allow typically OG, um, HTTP basic authentication, eventually an HTTP header, eventually uh, something else. Uh, but for example, in the web authentication chain, you will have the form authentication because you have your username and password in the, at the top of the page, and that's form authentication. It's not uh, basic authentication. So each area of GeoServer might have different authentication mechanisms. Um, does it, or the authentication providers are the ones that are uh, tasked to validate if the credentials you provided are valid. Uh, simple examples are uh, an XML file or a JDBC, uh, so a database table that contain the users and uh, some encrypted and salted passwords so that no one can read them, but just, you know, uh, they are enough to uh, validate whether the, the, the password that was provided is a match. Okay, so uh, that was the core authentication. We will talk about plugins later. Now, let's go into core authorization. So I already decided who you are, now I decide what you can do. That's authorization. Authorization can decide uh, whether you can use or not a certain service, like can you use WFS or can you use WFS transactional, for example. Um, it can decide whether you can administer or not a workspace, unless you are the administrator, in that case you can do anything, you are like root on a Linux uh, server. And it can decide whether or not you can see certain layers. Um, and it's all role-based. So, uh, this is the configuration of some, uh, uh, well, actually, actually it's the default GeoServer configuration for uh, uh, service access. The idea is that the general rule is you can do anything uh, regardless of who you are. But, for WFS, we allow you only read-only mode, so you cannot do transactions. And uh, the WFS create store query and the WFS transaction operations are allowed only to the administrator. So basically, it's locked down so that the usual suspects that might be used to change your data cannot be used by a random user. And then you can go and customize it and say, no, I have a class of users that can actually modify the data. I will attach the right role and they will be able to use transaction. Um, and this is how you configure one, uh, one of these rules. In terms of securing data, it's, this case is similar. Again, uh, well, this is not the default, but it's close to the default. Uh, the first rule says, uh, for any workspace, for any layer, in read-only mode, anyone can do any, everything. For any workspace, for any layer, in write mode, only the administrator can play. So basically, lock down so that you cannot change the data. And then for the reports workspace for any layer, you actually need to have the reports read role. Otherwise, those layers in the reports workspace are not there for you. Um, actually, this uh, depends on the catalog mode. So the catalog mode can be hide, which is the default. GeoServer will pretend the layers do not exist if you are, don't, have um, if don't have rights to access them. It will literally tell you, I don't know what this layer is, and it's, it may be there. In challenge mode, they give you uh, the full list in capabilities, in metadata, you know, in uh, uh, give me the list of layers that which are available. The moment you try to access one that is secured, they say, hey, wait, uh, you should authenticate. You should elevate your rights. So I'm telling you that the layer is there, but then I, I will make you authenticate. And then there is mixed, which hides the layers from the capabilities, and then triggers the authentication if you have a direct link to the data. So this was actually the, the mode, which is a bit strange, but the mode that uh, funded the, um, the development of a security subsystem in GeoServer. Then we have administration security rules. Uh, in GeoServer, you, could, you can be or you can make someone the administrator of a workspace. 
they cannot do everything. They cannot, do, they cannot configure grid sets in a tie cache, for example, new grid sets. Uh, they cannot set up security, but they can, within their workspaces, attach new data stores, create new layers, create new styles, so it's like they have a tiny little geo server on, at, at their control. It's useful for project managers, for uh, department manager, whoever only cares about managing the data and not the, the entire server. Okay, if this is not enough, we have a plugin called Geofence that can do more. Um, it's an authorization engine uh, that replaces the GeoServer basic author uh, authorization mechanism. So in GeoServer, you can, uh, you can have only one authorization engine active any, at any time. It's the default unless you install any plugin that provides an alternative. Then the alternative takes over. Um, in terms of Geofence, um, we have a, a list of rules which are evaluated more or less like IP tables, if you are familiar with it, so basically top to bottom. Uh, each rule can uh, uh, use several parameters to decide uh, if it's activated or not, so it's not just role-based. We can have uh, the username or the role, but also the IP address, but also the service and operation that is being accessed, but also the workspace and layer and layer group all together. So you can say something like, uh, I'm gonna give WFS access to all the layers if the uh, IP address comes from this range of IPs which happens to be my local network, for example. Like, I trust anyone that's logged in in my local network, which is something you wouldn't be able to do with uh, the normal Geo server. Or you can say something like, uh, this layer is, is accessible but only through WMS and not through WFS. You can do that with Geofence but not with the Geo server built-in security. The rules can be configured in three modes, which are deny, stop access, allow, allow access, or limit, which means that you already had an allow, which gave you access, but then you are shrinking the access to a particular subset of the data. Uh, allow rules can have, uh, um, if you choose a particular layer, uh, they can have a fine-grained control over the styles, so you can make certain styles visible only to certain users in case a certain style is revealing of uh, sensitive information. And so you only want certain subset of users to actually see that map uh, and only provide a more generic map with less information to the larger set of uh, users. Um, we can have SQL read and write filters what does it mean? It means that you can go with alphanumeric filtering and say, oh, okay, uh, any, uh, for this rule, for example, uh, you can see anything that is in category restricted and level is classified. And uh, so with alphanumeric filtering, I can decide to hide a certain portions of my data set uh, to certain users which is quite useful compared to the um, built-in mechanism where I can only say you can either see the layer completely or not. In this case, you, we can say, yeah, you can see the layer, but certain parts will be restricted. You will not be able to see them. At the same time, we can control which attributes you see in, in the vector result. So if the vector result has maybe 50 attributes and some of them are of sensitive nature, we can restrict uh, the, the visibility of those attributes to the large set of users and just say, okay, if you have a certain role, then you can see all the attributes. Otherwise, you will see only three or four. Um, in limit rules, uh, we can uh, apply a, a spatial filter uh, to uh, people that can access the data but uh, maybe are restricted to some, some geofences. Guess what? Um, and the idea is that you provide um, a polygon, uh, a polygon definition. And uh, so let's say that uh, I have a, a limit rule over the United States and that uh, red polygon is my, is my limit. Then I can set it up in clip on or intersect mode. In clip mode, it will actually clip the data over the uh, selected polygon and it will not allow me to see anything outside of it. 
in intersect mode, it will intercept and return anything that overlaps with the, uh, with the polygon, uh, allowing to see also outside. Use cases for this, um, well, restricted areas, military areas, you don't want to see, you don't want to show certain parts of your cartography to, to users, so you exclude it, that's one case. You make a polygon with a hole and the hole is your, um, uh, uh, whatever area that you don't want to show, or it's also useful for uh, uh, data collection. Say that you have 20 people going around with the mobiles collecting data through uh, the GPS, I don't know, uh, historical trees, uh, um, green areas management in the cities, uh, light, light poles, whatever. And uh, each of these users has an area that is supposed to be working on you can geofence every user in their own area so that they cannot touch data which is outside of their, their own competence. We also have administration rules, so through the, the geofence rules you can say, okay, this particular user is allowed to administer that particular workspace, one or more, and uh, um, they can be defined both by role and by username. So you can pinpoint one particular user or you can pinpoint a group of, you, a group of users by role. And then there is one thing that seems to be maybe a little strange, but we do it a lot, which is roll your own authentication or roll your, your own authorization. So picture a situation where you have uh, uh, an existing system that has already its own notion of rules, of who can access what and when and so on, and, uh, um, and you don't want to, to rewrite everything or, or duplicate these rules within the GeoServer own security system. So what do you do? Well, the Resource Access Manager, which is the plugin for Geo, that Geofence uses, it's actually open for customization. And so um, we have uh, customers that, I kid you not, use Excel sheets to de define how uh, people can uh, access the data, and then we have a uh, just a resource access manager that reads these Excel sheets and applies the rules that they defined, because j they just like to use that. that way. Well, when you use, when you know how to use Excel, you try to use to do everything with it, you know. And uh, so, yeah, uh, we have a, a number of. Uh, Custom resource success managers deploy that value customer site because they want to run their own particular uh, authorization logic. So we might have an enterprise authorization and an enterprise authentication because maybe they also have their own little way of authenticating. They are using a special HTTP header that needs to be uh, interpreted in a, their own particular way, and we can plug into that and make GeoServer work seamlessly in, in their environment. Other authentication plugins, we have the key authentication module, which allows to stick a key in the URL that would uh, um, authenticate you. You might think, oh, this is bad, but uh, API keys are actually pretty common for uh, using services like Google and, and, and friends, and you can manage the keys uh, so that they are linked to a session, they are short-lived, stuff like that, and so that simplifies the way the, the client uh, interacts with the server. We have uh, all two integrations of various, various types. Uh, recently, uh, Geocat contributed the JWT headers module, which provides a, a good um, uh, interaction with Apache. Um, Apache does the, all the uh, OpenID Connect dance, then it sets a few headers and GeoServer reads them and figures out who's the user, what are the roles, and so on, just based on the headers without having to interact with anymore with external services. And that's it. Thanks a lot, Andrea, for the presentation. Great. Um, other questions in the audience? There's a question above. Oh, there's another one, yeah, let's see. Uh, is it possible to integrate it with Azure AD? <clears throat> with Azure AD, AD for cloud? Um, it is possible, but uh, we don't have a plugin right now for Azure AD. Okay. But 
Um, I suppose it's another variation of open OAuth 2. It's open OAuth. Right. Yeah. So it should be a matter of customizing it a little bit to. Uh, so for OAuth, OAuth 2, we have uh, OAuth 2 Google, OAuth 2 Geonode, OAuth 2 Facebook. So it's a matter of figuring out the, the, the little bits that, that differ between the various implementation and implement them for Azure. So it's not there, but it shouldn't be difficult to, to implement. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, um, you said that the uh, geofence is replacing the whole authorization backend, um, or is it also authentication backend replacement? So how would I connect it with OpenID Connect authentication provider? Is it possible? So if I understand correctly, geofence replaces the authorization mechanism. So the, the rules that you might have set uh, for uh, workspaces and layers and services in the basic uh, built-in system uh, are going to be ignored. And uh, right now, we don't have a migration procedure. You will have to rewrite them for, for Geofence. But it's typically easy to, to do so. OK, and on top of that, I could have OpenID Connect as authentication backend too. I... Geofence is authorization, not authentication. Okay. So they are two, two in orthogonal uh, systems. So authentication decides if you are allowed to access and who you are and which roles you have. And then authorization takes over and decides what you can do, what you can see, which operations you can run, and so on. And so you can keep the built-in authentication and run Geofence because they are independent. Anyone else? So I have a question. Um, did you already get requests for two-factor authentication? Not yet. Not yet, OK. And um, another question, can you describe how easy it is to set up GeoPens and to get it running with GeoServer? Well, there is an easy way there's a, and there is a hard way. GeoPens can run either as a GeoServer plugin that you just stick into GeoServer like any other plugin, and it's done, uh, and it manages the rules in, a, in an H2 database, a local database, which I wouldn't recommend for production, but it's really easy to get started with. Like, you literally drop the jars, restart, and start figuring out how Geofence works. For production, you can still do that, but there is one configuration file that you have to modify to make it talk to an external PostgreSQL or whatever database, which is definitely going to be better for production systems. And then there is the really hard version, which is having uh, Geofence run as an external application that GeoServer talks to. Uh, we use it less and less, but sometimes it's uh, interesting because maybe you have uh, uh, various, several deploys of GeoServer in different uh, domains, and you wanted to have a single authorization server running for all of them. And that allows you to uh, control the rules for multiple GeoServers. But it's a use case that's not very common. Good. Are there more questions in the audience? OK. It does not look like. Andrea, you are at the booth. You are a sponsor of the conference. So if you want to talk to Andrea Amy, you are welcome to see him at the booth. We have some more talks. And we will hear you in a lightning talk in a minute. So another applause for Andrea.